worked with Bank Venture Capital on a big online engine called Penn Foster. And then decided that I should try higher ed. So last July I arrived. Um, but, you know, um, I'm probably uh, one of those people that are going to tell you that there's probably no, no business in the world is the same as it was five years ago. And um, the field of education has been the slowest to move. So I want to set the stage with you this morning about the dramatic changes we see occurring and the, and the changes happening so quickly in education now. Um, I worry. I worry about our schools being able to change fast enough. Um, it used to, we always would talk about incremental change, and now um, New Hampshire, the state of New Hampshire just put out a, a new paper called Vision 2.0, and uh, the commissioner and others, I was a part of that committee, and we said, look, we can't, we can't go incrementally anymore. It has to be massive. It has to be all, all hands on deck. We've got, we've got to take education to the next level. So let me just talk a little bit. Um, I want to set the stage about some of my dreams about the School of Ed, and then I want to tell you, then I want to talk to you about the landscape of education and some theories that seem to be emerging in education that are very different from the way I was trained to teach. So um, I'm just going to say that uh, this, I, you can't read this. It's, if you can, you're really good. Um, but there was a vision, there was a mission statement when I got here, and I, just, I was actually Kathy Savinger, uh, one of my department heads, is here. We were talking about changing it. I just have this all-out fear um, that I just don't want to be anybody in education. So um, I'm pushing us to talk about producing the best-in-class graduates in the K-12 world of education, the best-in-class, the people that really know how to deliver learning in multiple ways, online, traditional, hybrid, fully online, one-to-one um, -one tutorial. I mean, we need to train our educators to really take this thing on. And in order to do that, um, you won't be able to read this as well, but we've decided, we've, well, you may be able to if you're close enough, but we've, and it's actually on a handout, but I just want to tell you a couple of changes we're going to make. And one of the changes we're making um, this year is we're starting, to, we're starting to build our graduates to spend an entire year out in the schools, their senior year, that they don't come to campus. They spend that in a school. And so I know I think Matthew's a principal, right? So it, the thing is, we want to give them a student that has been trained for three years, but then we want them to be in a school for a year. And we want them to be able to, if the principal needs a substitute, that there's a partnership, like use, use these students and have these students pair with other teachers, have them get to understand the circadian rhythm of a school, you know, from the start to the finish. And so when they graduate, They've spent a full year. They've been in a school. They know what it's like. And, the, and, um, and it's a better partnership for schools because they can count on these people every day as part of their year's worth of activity. That's where we're going. Um, that's not a requirement of our incoming freshmen. It's a recommendation to our incoming freshmen. The next group coming in next year, that's going to be a requirement. We're going to want you to spend a year. And the other thing uh, that we're working on is reducing the cost of that year. So we would drive the cost of that year way down. We would still have seminar for, our, for those students. They would touch base as a seminar, but that's our theory. Our theory is, you know, we can talk to you all we want about playing tennis, but until you get on the court and someone hits a ball at you, you never really understand how to play the game. So that's where we're going to take our field of education here at SNHU. And the other thing that we're doing is we're creating a center for innovative practices in a center for innovative practice in education at the university. Where right now we're out seeking um, some funding, and Don Brzezinski's already found us some money, and we're out looking hard. But we want a center, and we've already established this center where we um, we we understand the best in hybrid and blended learning, and we have some experts in, on in the field here at the university. We are. Uh, we have a partnership with Russ Qualia and, a, and an international group called Teacher Voice, like really understanding um, how the teachers feel about the future and how they're impacted. And uh, Teacher Voice group has got people on the board like Michael Fullen, if you understand change research, and uh, John Hattie, one of the, probably the leading educational researchers in the world today. He'll, he'll be, they'll be here at our center um, doing some work with us. But there's lots of things we're going to focus on, competency-based education. I'm just going to populate that. But our key is really focusing on personalized learning. Um, 
and there's a big shift in the field of education right now going away from what people would say would be individualized learning to personalized learning. And personalized is really driven by the student. And it's a very different thing. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But that's this little guy up top. And um, the last uh, circle I, I want to mention about this center is that we're, we have a partnership with a group called LTS, which is a digital game-based learning group. And um, you know the adaptive engines that we see being used for skill acquisition, teaching children like double-digit addition with carrying, or anything that's just basic skills, there's, there's great success, great neuroscience that points to the value of game-based learning and its advantages. And by doing that, it's not removing a teacher from the job, uh, but what it's doing, it's allowing the teacher to take on higher, more difficult challenges. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. But I just wanted to get you a sense of where I believe we need to go. Um, we just don't want to have a school of education. We want to have a center for innovative practice in education that, that's housed at the school of education, that's cutting edge and looking at where we need to move the, the needle in education. That's our goal. Um, I'm not going to talk about all these things, but when I, I do a lot of uh, talks around the country, and I always try to tell people I'm a teacher by trade, so I like to, this is my lesson plan. So I want to talk for a couple of minutes about the landscape, and then I want to talk about a theory of self-learning, um, which I think is what is really driving massive change in education and a difference for teachers, how we should be training teachers in the future. So. Um, this is just a, uh, I was in England a couple of weeks ago, I was serving a board there, and um, the gentleman uh, put this slide up, and this is what happens in 60 seconds on the internet. All right, so in 60 seconds, there's 25 hours of video uploaded every 60 seconds of every day, of every clock tick. That's, you know, that's like a minute, it's crazy. There's um, almost 700,000 Google searches every minute on the internet. I put that up there because when I started teaching, I had the Encyclopedia Britannica in my classroom. And that was where all the knowledge in the room sat, there and in the teacher's guide. And I was trained as a teacher to use that stuff to teach children to learn. And that's just not even, that's so far from where we are today. So far, you know, in my pockets, my, my iPhone, and, you know, I have access to more, just so many things. But we, we were fixated. We had knowledge that was in 26 volumes. That was it, sat there. If you wanted to study Nebraska, you went to the end. They looked it up. You know, they wrote a couple of sentences. They made a map and put a picture of corn in the middle of it, and <laughs> Nebraska. And then they say, oh, great, now we'll move on to another state. Um, so go... But that's not the way it is anymore. But I was trained for that. So um, the challenge is that we have this fond memory of schools. And everyone does. And, you know, but everyone wants their school, as it says here, everyone, almost everyone wants the schools to be better. But the issue is very few people want them to be different. And my point is that they're going to have to be incredibly different in order to be better. And that's the challenge we have is the status quo. Everybody knows what schools look like. We're getting ready to start them up again because the kids have been working on the farms all summer. And I mean, we have a model of educating our kids that just is so outdated. It doesn't make any sense anymore. And we have to dramatically attack that. I just want to say for those of you in the field of education, teachers aren't going away. Schools aren't going away. They just need to be different. Actually, teachers will be even more important once we get into it. So it's first different than better. And I like to think that we spend too much time trying to perfect the past. Right? So you can't build the future of schools by perfecting what we're doing now. And I think most schools spend a lot of time trying to perfect what's going on in them, rather than leading them to the next place where they need to go. Does that make any sense? It's just that, it's that we spend a lot of time trying to fix things. So this is my favorite um, little cartoon about you know, um, the idea that the world is moving, and you know we're going to be a dinosaur if we don't move it quickly. So what I want to do, um, let me get to this little diagram. Um, there was a basic flaw in how our systems are designed, and 
this was the good this was a good design when we had a big you know the bell curve when we had a big middle in our country this was the perfect design this is how we designed our schools I used to chair the National Dropout Prevention Board and I built this slide for that board and I just want to share it with you because this points to why Southern New Hampshire University is moving to competency-based learning. The state of New Hampshire is moving to competency-based learning because there's a, there's a flaw in the design of our, of our schools. So if you think about it, this little line from, uh, from here up, the vertical, is all the knowledge you need in, say, kindergarten or senior year in high school or freshman year or whatever. That's all the knowledge. The line on the bottom is the number of days. And we give everybody in the state of New Hampshire or in most states we give everybody 180 days to learn all the knowledge that they need for one year. And I like to refer to those kids as the on-pace students. They need exactly 180 days. Because there's a lot of kids that only need about 60 days. But we make them wait. And then there's a lot of kids, and I've you know, grown up with a lot of these kids, that need a lot more. But what we do is we stop them at 180 days and say, you're done. And um, the tragedy is that our dropouts come from the, the lower line, but a lot of them come from the upper line because we make them wait. And we, we can't keep up with them. It's a real tragedy. And I, when I look at this design, I think of this design very much like my wife's a runner. And um, so if you were to think that we were, you know, if we ran races like this, so we would say, we're going to do a half marathon. So it's at 13.1, 13.1, right? Yeah. Okay. She's got a sticker on the I was trying to remember the back of the car, 13.1. Right? So, um, but if we said that, every week, you know, we're all going to run a marathon. I, I'm not a runner, a half marathon. I know I could do it, but it would take me a long time, and I'd stop for coffee quite often. And, you know, I'd eventually get there. But I could start and I could finish. I would walk some. I would, you know maybe sit around a bit, you know, but I would get there. But you see, the way we design education right now when it's time-based, fixated on time, is that we say to everybody, okay, you've got two hours to run 13.1 miles. If you get there before two hours, you must wait to cross the finish line. And at the two-hour clock mark, everyone steps across. We know elite runners are going to get there much earlier. We know others, but like me, I'm like back here somewhere still like walking, and I know I could get there, but they stop everyone, and they say, okay, now you have to move on. When we do that with kids in schools, when we fixate time around learning, it really is, it complicates their life in many ways. It makes them feel like they can't accomplish it. And in some subjects, they can move much faster than others, and in others, so it, you know, it, it just, it's, it's lopsided needs to be driven by what they need to know. And that's the movement toward competency-based is really driving that. And I like to think that if you're focused on seat time these days, you're focused on the wrong end of the kid. Whether they're at college, whether they're in elementary rooms, it's not the right end to be focused on. It's being focused on their, on, on their learning. Because we want these students to be incredible learners. We don't want them to just be fixated on time. It's not a race. It's about learning. And if we can build that kind of a, hi. <laughs> um, so let me get beyond this. But you know, this is a great quote. This quote came from a book called The Great Shift. And, and here's the quote, it's, I'll read it. Uh, Knowing with certainty that someone has mastered a discipline means it shouldn't matter how the person got there or what school they attended. At that point, traditional education's monopoly on delivery would end. And America would see a myriad of new models and providers of education. See, it's like, we have kids that are spent all summer. They, who knows what they've been doing? They could be learning all kinds of things. But if they come to school and they spent the summer taking an online course from Stanford in algebra and come into a school, most of the time the school would say, that's great, but you have not spent 180 days with, you know, with Mr. Johnson, and so you've got to go there and wait. Um, we have to be able to recognize learning. And we have to be able to recognize informal learning. So um, I worked at the Gates Foundation for two and a half years. And what I could tell you is that Bill Gates cannot be a technology director in a school district in the United States of America. That doesn't make sense. But he has no degree. 
but I think he knows a lot about technology. <laughs> and it would be kind of unusual for somebody. I mean, he, would, he couldn't get a job at a university. It doesn't make sense. It just doesn't make sense anymore. And that, you know, demonstrating learning is really what it's about. What is a B? Somebody gets a B in English. I don't know what they can do. We don't know. But if we could break the skills down and we could say, these are the things they can accomplish, that's what you want. You know, so the focus is really shifting to a personalization and, and competency-based learning. Does that make any sense, that kind of ramble? Um, I want to move to another theory here. I'm going to get beyond this. Um, I'm going to get beyond that. Um, yeah, I always like to show my... Don't you, didn't I show you that before? I think I, I know you've seen it a million times, Kathy. Um, well, let me, let me show it. Um, let me show this. It's, um, it's a quick video, and I won't tell you why I'm going to show it to you uh, until it's over. This is the hollow head. Actually, at the moment, it's a perfectly normal head of Charlie Chaplin. But wait, as it comes round, you'll see, or will you, that it's hollow. The back of it coming round now is actually a hollow mask. It appears to rotate in the opposite direction, and amazingly, the nose sticks out, although it's actually sticking in. Coming round I'll let now it come around one more time. The normal, correct, as it were, face. And wait again as it comes round, and you'll see this extraordinary thing like Jekyll and Hyde. Both the noses stick out because it's so unlikely that a nose sticks in that a face is hollow. So you see it as convex, although it's in fact concave. And so, um, I, I showed you that because of two things. One is really cool. Um, and you need something cool when you do a speech or when you're at breakfast. And, um, but the other reason I showed it to you is because what happens is your brain overrides, your brain overrides what, the, what your eyes are seeing. Your brain says that's incorrect. Noses do not stick in. The brain sees faces every single day. The nose sticks out. The cheeks puff out. So, the eye, so when, the, when, the brain's, when the eye's showing the brain this, the brain instantaneously says that's wrong. I'll fix it. And it does. And it fixes it. In such a lightning second, you don't even realize it. And even if you stare at this for hours, like I did one night, saying, you know, it's a mask, it's a mask, trying to tell my brain, hey, don't mess with it, it's a mask. And I did try that, actually. Um, and I, with a couple of glasses of wine. Um, but the thing was, it always came out because the brain override. Why did I show it to you? I showed it to you because we've all grown up looking at schools. And when we see a school, we see it starting in. Late, late August, early September, having breaks at certain times. We see first grade followed by second grade, followed by third grade. We see English separate from science, separate from math. We see recess. We see all these things. And when someone starts saying schools can be different, your brain actually fights it. The neurosciences will tell us your brain's connected. We see, we see schools a certain way. So we, immediately we resist it. That's why very rarely innovation very rarely comes out of the field where, you know, from the, from the field itself because the people in it see it that way and they have a hard time thinking differently. And that's one of the pieces of um, neuroscience and research that we've been finding in education that, you know, we just know what schools are all about. We're, ex you know, experts. It even says it right here. I was, I'm gonna send, if my mom was alive, I would send this to her, Ex, meet the expert or something like that. But I'm not an expert. I really am only a player in this field called education. I'm not sure anyone has enough knowledge. But the, the danger is, quite frankly, expert. That's the danger. You know, when a child has a reading problem, we surround them with reading teachers to try to figure this out, and they come up with the very similar reading programs that everyone else does. And maybe it's, a, maybe it's a motivation problem. Maybe it's something else. But we have to be more cautious about this. We have to really start to think very differently. So I've been, most of my writing in the last five years has been on something called moving from best practices to next practices. And um, what I love about the work here at Southern New Hampshire is uh, 
I used to work with Paul Blank when he was at Marlboro College, and I was a superintendent in Brattleboro, and we used to disrupt then. And um, we built a couple of interesting schools. But this theory of disruption is important. And um, I'll show you what happens now in most systems. So what happens is we, I'll just say this is Ray McNulty's school down the road. It's a K-8 school. Very fancy, too. And, um, and this is a faculty meeting, and you're my faculty. And Robert has this idea, right? He has this idea right there. So what we do is we take our school and we put his idea into it. But his idea doesn't really fit the model. So what we do to his idea is we take it and we do this to it. We make it fit our school because we're the experts. And then what we do is we cut. This is called sustaining innovation in the research. We cut these things off. These are really interesting and new ideas, and I refer to those as next practices. We don't, we don't see them fitting in our school. Like, well, how would you let a kid, if, how would you let a kid move if there's 60 days he's done the work? What would we do with him? You know, oh, we'll put him in the principal's office. He could, you know, take attendance every day or something. I don't know. He could do something, but we we just can't see it that way. And the way the the way you know Clay Christensen and all the work that drove a lot of the transformation here at SNHU. Uh, would be is Clay would say you take the idea and you throw it into the system with fidelity and you make the system completely change to take the idea on. That's called disruptive innovation. So you know the models of disruptive innovation. Real quickly, one of them is like the cell phone. You know, this cell phone in my pocket was not the first cell phone. Do you remember the bag phone? Some of you do. Some of you don't. But the bag phone was like this thing, and you had a magnetic antenna on your car and all that. If you didn't have that, you wouldn't have this. The bag phone wasn't great, but it, 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 they pushed it out to the market, and then they had version 2, version 3, version 4, version 5. And so you get to this, and you say, well, we need, you know, we need this kind of an idea. Well, this wasn't the first idea. And so we need to push things into our schools to try them and not abandon them, but then you know, iterate them, create iterations. Um, so, oh, and a lot of people will suggest in education, particularly public education, that we can't do that because policy won't let us. So if you believe that, you need to just go away because policy is the last thing to change. Um, as a commissioner of education, I could not change public policy until I had a practice that showed results to make me change policy. So what you need to do is we need to create, iterate, we need to, we need to be adventurous. We need, we need to be like Google where we have innovation is part of our culture in schools, that we try things. We try things and we study them and we, we, we measure their impact. We become our own area for innovation. And we need to start to do that. And um, uh, I, I, was, I put that in because usually when I'm doing a big talk, people will, People will say to me, Ray, that's never going to happen. We'll never change. Well, you know, we used to smoke everywhere. We used to smoke in airplanes. People used to light cigarettes in the aisles of airplanes. I can't even get, a, like, water through security now, right? But pilots would smoke. We had smoking in schools. The public schools had smoking areas for our students. We don't anymore. If you put our, our efforts into this, we can really transform schools. Let me just, I'm going to make a quick leap ahead and then open it up to questions. And I want to make a leap ahead because I want to talk about, so what do we need to think about when we think about learning? Because kids need, con they need all this stuff. What are we going to do? So I'm going to blow by some of my hokey slides that I generally talk. I, I, always remember, I always like to talk about, remember when we used to take pictures with film? And you used to count them and people would pose. You know, you, know, you don't do that anymore. That's changed. That industry is totally transformed. And believe it or not, um, most of the professional photographers, when digital photography came out, they said, I'll never go to that. I'll always have film. Film is the per Guess what? Digital is way better than, than, than film-based photography ever, ever was. How'd that happen? Because in the beginning, it wasn't. Because they kept iterating it, right? Version 1, version 2, version 3, version 4. So those are the kind of models we have to think about when we think about learning. Um, so there's this theory of self-learning that's been emerging, and I've been meeting with lots of educators around the country, actually in Europe as well, on this theory. 
It's not that fancy. But um, it's built off of the mindset that uh, long ago Peter Drucker said in 1995, he said, um, the power in, consum in the consumer world is going to shift from the, you know, it's going to shift to the um, customer because the customer has more information now. So the way you think about that is that um, if you've bought a TV or a, a car or a refrigerator lately, you didn't go to a store and just say, show me what you got. You went into the store and you said, I printed this out and these are the two models I'm looking at and I'd like this one and this is what I pay for it. And you know, the consumer has power in the purchasing world now that they did not have before. And that's an interesting, so that, so the, what's happened is the internet has kind of driven that because knowledge is everywhere, right? So the same thing has gone on in the field of education and we've ignored it. So I, um, just looking at my time, I, just, I, know, I am, I just want to see about, it's quarter up, okay, good. So I was gonna, I'm going to just show you this quick little video. Um, it's a teacher talking and his name is Jordan Dolier. He's a teacher in, um, on the island of Oahu on the uh, Waianae coast, which is a really high crime area. He's a young teacher and he's going to tell a story about wanting to be a fantastic uncle and he's going to relate that to being a teacher. And he, he makes a better case than I do about self-learning and then I'll show you the design that we need to think about. And then we can talk. All right, so uh, go back to my microphone here. And I've always wanted to be a fantastic uncle. As the youngest of three brothers, uh, with one brother who's four and another brother who's eight years older than me, I always kind of figured I wasn't going to have kids first, or so I hoped. Um, and when my first niece was born, I made sure to take every opportunity I could to do what I thought a fantastic uncle would do. Now, one such opportunity, I was in the back uh, lanai at my parents' house, and I was sitting with one of my brothers, and my niece, Haley, who was five years old at this time, that's her, uh, she came up to me, and she tapped me. She said, Uncle Jojo, I'm Uncle Jojo. Uh, she said, Uncle Jojo, would you please get me some juice? And I thought to myself, like, of course I can get you some juice. I want to be a fantastic uncle. I'll get you all the juice in the world. I'll make it just rain juice upon you. Of course I'll get you some juice. So I stood up. And as I stood up, I felt a tap on my shoulder. And I looked, and it was my brother. And he said, hey, where are you going? And I thought, well, I'm going to go be a fantastic uncle. I'm about to get my niece some juice. And he said, well, do you think she could do that for herself? And I hadn't thought of that. So I said, well, well what, do you, what do you mean? And he said, well, really, what does it take to get juice? And I said, well. I, you know, I'd have to go inside, and I'd have to open the refrigerator, and I'd have to, you know, pick up a packet of juice, and, you know, and unscrew the cap, and, you know, and give it to Haley. And he's like, okay. Now, do you think she's capable of doing that herself? And I said, you know, I want to believe in my niece. I want to be a fantastic uncle, so of course she could do that by herself. And he looked at me, and he said, well, then why would you take that experience away from her? And why would you make her depend on you? to get juice. And I had not thought of it like that. And as an educator, I found that sometimes in my drive to do what I think a fantastic educator would do and do as much as I can, sometimes I've taken away meaningful experiences from my students. Because sometimes what we do for others is a tacit statement of what we believe they can't do for themselves. So when Jordan talks about that, I think often about how much we do for our kids in schools and how great teachers want to do everything for them. And my point is, so where is, if we want children, if we want not just children, but even adults to be lifelong learners, when do we let them take over the learning? When in the K-12 system do we? When, you know, well, I'll give you the quick answer. We don't, all right, because we give them a teacher every year, and the teacher tells them exactly what to do, when to do it, when to turn it in, and how to do it. So who do they depend on for learning? They depend on the school, the teacher. There's no gradual release of responsibility for the learning. 
If you just think about that, um, you know, we design things for them to just sit, pay attention, and respond. And I'm not suggesting that that's not, that doesn't play a place in education, but when do we let go? I, when you raise your children, those of us that have raised many of them, um, what we do is we slowly let them go stay at a friend's house and then stay for overnight and then maybe go to a day camp and then maybe go to an overnight camp. And we slowly raise them to leave us, we hope. Sometimes they come back and, you know, it's all that kind of stuff. But um, the fact of the matter is we, we want them to be able to be on their own. When do we let that happen? Even here at the university, I laugh about it sometimes. Like, you know, it's, you know, I'm not suggesting you know you, you sit in your, your your classroom and you say they come in. Well, welcome to you know English 101, and I hope you have a good time. There's the there's the stuff. Get going. You know, if you need me, I'm over here drinking coffee. No, it's not the way you know. But see, we don't design things for self-learning. We don't really get into that field. <clears throat> See, teaching's only one way to learn. And, it's, and it used to be the way, you know, but now it's just a small piece of what learning can be. Just think of the university here and the online engines and, you know, all the things we can think about. I mean, it's just it's so many ways to learn. So I've been going around the country the last five years with Bill, and we keep, I go into, I was, uh, I was in South Carolina last week in a massive school district, uh, 1,200 teachers. I said, so spend a few minutes and talk to the people in the room. What do we mean by learning? What's learning? It's like, whoa. It's like a trick question. I said, what is it? You know, everybody, if, it, if that's our business, what is learning? Is learning when I tell you something and then you tell it back to me? No, because neuroscience say if you just do that that way, guess what? They forget it the moment they leave that room. We've all experienced that. You know? Um, but that's not, you know, I think learning is when we, we really get to the point, this is just my opinion, this is, this is not research-based right now, we're still playing with this, but it's really when the transfer goes to the, to the student and they take on, they go, this is so cool, I am going to do this on my own. Then it's, then it's real learning. Now, I'm not going to spend time on, I, I tweeted this out, a, uh, this is like one of, a tweet that got bounced around a lot, but a teacher who teaches a student to learn without them, that's the one that prepares them for the 21st century. That's the job. The job of the educator is not to do it. It's to get them to do it. That's what it's all about, right? So um, in, in, instead of thinking when we're in this room, and, and I think of Kathy because she's an amazing you know, teacher of the year, amazing member of my faculty and administration. And, People are like, well, how do we teach something? Like, how do we teach this math course? Or how do we teach this, right? We shouldn't think of it that way anymore. We should think of it this way. How would I learn this? If I had to learn this, how would I design it so I could learn it? Not that I could teach it. So like right now, if, if we were here for like an all-day meeting, I'd say, you know, give you a challenge. Like, you know, how to, I don't know everybody at this table, but I'd say, okay, you guys got to, do a presentation on how to replace the front brake pads on a Honda Civic uh, 2001, and you, you know, and you get, and and just give you an iPad or you got the Apple over there already, and just say you're going to teach the whole group how to do it, and you got half an hour, and then you know you guys got to teach the something I never remember how to do the Pythagorean theorem. Right? You guys got to teach everybody that and nobody here knows it anyway. So, um, but. You know, what would we do? We would start Googling it. We'd start going and we'd start figuring out. And here's the thing. When you learn something on your own, you will not forget it. You will not forget it. So I've been playing with this theory. This is the last slide I'm going to show, and then we'll open up for questions. But um, this is not a fancy theory. It's just a, a talking slide. But before I share this with you, um, I want to first talk about two things. So my experiences at Penn Foster before I got here were around this. And one of the guys I worked with was a guy by the name of Joe Gagnon. Joe was the head of IBM Global Research for like five years. He was the guy that helped build out the self-checkout in the supermarket. He, did, he was on the Walmart account. They built this whole thing out. So um, you all know self-checkouts, right? Okay, good. So here's what Joe would tell you. 
Self-checkouts, a $3 million study, are the slowest checkouts in the supermarket. That's the first thing. Second thing, they are the most satisfying checkout in the supermarket. What? Yep, they're the, they're the slowest, they're the most satisfying. I said, Joe, it can't be. He, so he goes and pulls all the research, but he gives the example. I'll give you an example. Walk into a supermarket, go to a professional checker router, you know, whatever, the uh, cashier, I guess. I don't know what they are. Uh, anyway, so he or she is checking out your stuff, and if you're standing there, and they have your six-pack of Coke, and they're going like this over the scanner, and it's not beeping, and they're doing it like three, four, five times, and how do you feel? Like you're standing there going like, will you hurry up? You know, you're the pro. This should be one swipe, right? I mean, and they're doing this, and then they take the glasses, and they start punching the number in. And actually, they have physically, the people waiting are getting angry. It's like, come on! You know, this should be fast. Now, when you're going through the self-checkout, and you got your six-pack of Coke, and you're going like that, and nothing's going beep, and you're doing it, you know, licking your hands, and you're wiping it, and tilting it, and it goes beep, and then you put it on a belt, and, you know, you, you're, you're accomplishing it yourself. And, you know, three hours later, when you check out, it's like, <laughs> it's like, it's like, I did it. I did it. <laughs> I'm just telling you, they spend a lot. I can show you the data. It's, it's, it's the slowest, but for many of us, it's the most satisfying. That's right, they do. And they're getting much better, though. Remember the iterations? Uh, I can just say that with, with incredible confidence, because I've seen the report, that's the truth. Uh, now, are there outliers? Yes. All right, I want to give you one more example, and then I'll explain this little diagram to you. The other example is Amazon. So hold, hold in your mind that things, when you learn and do things yourself, it's a more satisfying experience. That's not a hard concept to hold on to. The other one is, think about Amazon. Everyone buy something on Amazon? How many bought something while I was talking? It's like, I always ask that, because a lot of times people do. It's like, oh yeah, I just bought a car. Um, it's like, but um, here's the thing about Amazon. Amazon creates an experience for you that is totally, you are in total charge. They give you everything you need to make every decision about buying. And they give it to you so you are in control. Right? They don't want you to talk to a person. They want to give you everything. And if you're buying, my favorite example is shoes. If you're buying shoes or something, you, know, you can see how they fit. Different people say it's oversized, undersized, whatever. But if they have different colors and it says they come in red and you click on the blue button and it, they turn blue and you click on the red button, they don't turn red. And you call them and you, or you send them an email, that night they will fix that button so that that question will never have to be answered again because they want the experience to be flawless and they want you to control it. Right? So they you give you sh many shipping ideas and all that. You control it. That's Amazon. All right? Now, I want you to think about learning now. I'm going to take the shift. Boom. And I'm, going to, I'm not talking about high-level rigor, high-level thinking, those of you that know high-level bloom. I'm talking about skill acquisition, the stuff that teachers spend a lot of time on, writing complete sentences, you know, double-digit addition with carrying, and all multiplicate, all those things, right? And I am, we're getting more sophisticated. We can even do higher-level thinking, but just at the basic level, Double-digit addition has not changed in centuries. Every year, teachers spend tons of time teaching double-digit addition to kids, right? They design it to teach it to everybody, and then they let them do their thing. But what if, you know, we designed it like Amazon, and we said, you've got to start, right? So you design everything for self-help first. Here's a video I did on how to do it. Teach, the kids watch, they watch it independently. They work alone. They, they have projects that you get them to do, but it's all on their own. And then you also tell them, but you know, look, here, if you don't get it at that point, guess what? James can talk to Aaron, and you guys can work together on it because Aaron's got it, and James is still struggling with it. But the, by the way, the teacher is this one at the very top, one-to-one. -one. The teacher is watching the learning. You know, watching the learning. And she's seeing, like, what, what was James' problem? 
well, James didn't really understand that video very well, so maybe I need to make a third video or a fourth video that kind of takes that little niche and nuance where he didn't understand it and, and redo my video or change it a little bit. But the teacher's watching the learning that's going on, allowing the student to try it themselves, then work with other students, then maybe reach out to somebody else. Maybe it's a teacher, but maybe it's a paraprofessional, or maybe it's a brother or a sister. And then the teacher deals with the toughest challenges in the room, the toughest ones, the ones that need the personalized help. Amanda is just not getting it, so I'm going to go spend 10 minutes with Amanda. Right? But the learning is going to be designed not for me to give it to everybody. If you think about how we do it now, we do it like this. I'm going to teach you all to do double-digit addition. Now, Robert doesn't need me doing that. He's a whiz. But he's got to sit and listen because I'm setting it up that way. And there may only be two students that need, but what I'm doing is I'm taking control of the learning and not giving them control of the learning. Does that make sense? So in the future, what we really need to start to begin to do is you know, really think about um, what the student's need for a teacher is and what the different models are. So in math, somebody may have a low need for a teacher, and in English, they may have a high need for a teacher. Totally different kid, but we give them the same kid, but two different expectations. That so we have to think about how we deliver our our learning to our students. And um, I'm not going to go there. I just want to buzz by this for a second, and get back to this, and just say. Um, I leave you with this thought that the, the landscape is dramatically different and the model of delivery has to be radically different. And it's about adult learning before it's about student learning changing. We have to change the, the people that are driving the system. It's, you know, the students are not, they are the potential, not the problem. They actually, if you let them loose, there's almost no end to what they could do. So, um, so I'll leave it at that and um, say that's why we're heading in this direction and heading to try to really rethink how we train our educators for the future. And um, questions, chat, whatever, scary. Oh, yeah. Ah. Uh, but you are. <laughs> yeah. Well, the model has been, you know, there's an expert that you go to that gives you, and it's like, it's really a different model, you know, and, and um, I, uh, we struggle with it. Kathy and I were talking about this theory just the other day with some of our supervising teachers. We're trying to tell them not to always jump in you know, if, uh, I'll give you an example. I was working with a bunch of New York principals, and they had some teachers working with them, and they were from Code Academy, the coding schools. And the teacher, um, I was sharing this theory, and the teacher put his hand up, and he said, uh, one of those principals over there wrote a bad review of me because I didn't rush to help a student. And um, he said, he was explaining that the student was struggling, so I'll say, Alexander was struggling, and I went over, the teacher went over and looked at his coding and said, I see his problem. And the teacher looked at him and said, look at that again, Alexander. You know, and he was still struggling, and the teacher said, I'm not, I, I, you, can, you can solve this problem. Just pay attention and go back down again. The principal was like, not helping student, you know, um, violation, red flag, you know. And all of a sudden, you know, so the principal left. Three or four minutes later, the kid yelled out, oh my god, what a stupid error. And he had put parentheses in a wrong, and he, he did not close out one parenthesis or something. That's all he had done. And what the teacher said to the group, that Alexander will never make that mistake again, because he now is really good at that, right? But if I had gone over and said, oh, just fix this right here, what would he have learned? He would have depended on me for his, you know. So there's a real nexus in this theory, but other thoughts? Yeah. I get all morning. A lot of everybody here does. I
They did? Oh, I have nine grandkids. had three elections and it doesn't matter. want to talk to a person. You know, I, I think that sometimes we, um, and I, I don't, I'd love to have an answer for that. And if somebody does, please, because, um, you know, yeah, but, you know, one of the things is that we see, we see a different language at times. People see a different language at this time as a, as a handicapping condition when, you know, they have content knowledge. They just can't communicate it often. And so it's, you know, we talk, you know, I, 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 I experience this a lot, you know, worked in, you know, inner city Detroit and LA doing consulting and you know the the population diversity is so incredible and we when we, we try to homogenize things and we can't you know it, that's the challenge is that we've got to recognize the individual differences that's why personalized learning is becoming a more powerful piece we the technology piece just for going back for a second is that you know technology can help us adapt a lot faster and um, the challenge has been that education is, a, is the one field that believes that technology is an added cost and not a savings cost. So most businesses see technology as helping them save. And in education, they see, we can't afford any technology. Businesses can't afford not to have technology. Our view is that we can't afford technology. There is a massive you know, upside down nature of that. It, and the fact is that there's, there is money in I can tell you that there's, there, if we spent our money differently, um, there is money to, to do this work. And um, I, I work with a, a group that uses an adaptive engine, and they've got a lot of refugees and things. But you know, they could they could they could put skill acquisition in four different languages, in um, for math and for science and for social studies. And these kids are really good at it, and they slowly acquire the you know more skills. And they have adaptive engines that drive it for them, and then the teachers manage it, and they can they can see the scores and all of that. But I mean, it's there's a you know, the diversity is throwing us all for a loop, and it the reason it is is that we see everything homogenized, and it's not. We have to be we have to figure out how to break the system apart, um, 
And, and my, my sense of holding kids by time and stamping them like they're kindergartners and, they're, you know, and they've only got so many days to get to learn everything in kindergarten, it's just, it's a real, it's a challenge for us all. So many other places are just avoiding, you know, moving beyond that. And uh, the, other the other threatening thing when you were talking earlier about the grandchildren is that they're not being graded and scored on any of their attempts to try things. And um, there's real value to that. I think um, there's such downward pressure on schools and students to be the same and to be heavily tested. I think the testing should be more about what Ray could do, what Rich can do, what Aaron can do. And, you know, it's not about, you know, massive, massive testing that pits students against other students. And, you know, competition would not be nice. If you, if you all came in today and we said, okay, we're all going to sit you, you know, at your tables by SAT scores, you know, it's like, it's, no, that doesn't make any sense. It, you know, it, but we have such a pressure for that. So, like, in the trial and error, we have to teach kids when to use trial and error in learning and when not to. That's all. And once we can, once they can figure that out, um, we, I watch kids on adaptive learning engines. They're being assessed every time they hit a hit a button. They don't even know it, right? But it's it's back. It's it's monitoring them, and they're being incredibly courageous. Your grandchildren, a new operating system comes up. They're not afraid to see if I hit this, what happens? You know, and we know from neuroscience too that that's incredible learning. The brain is firing all the time. It's not evil, you know. Uh, so I just don't know where to take it, except that it, we're in this real incredibly difficult transformation where we have policymakers looking for test results, and we have great diversity, and there's a real mismatch there. And, you know, you, you look at places like Singapore, which used to be a heavily tested country, they now, the mission of their educational system is we educate our children for the unknown. That's their mission. That's a pretty wonderful mission. You know, because they say the kids will face more unknown in their life than known. So what do we do? We educate them for a, a set of information and then we test them all. And they freak out about it. And then we rank and sort our kids. Um, and that's unfortunate. So I think there's a, I think the shift has got to begin. I'm hopeful, but not overly hopeful. Just looking, practicing good wait time. All the teachers in the room know, okay, counting to myself. Let's see, thanks, uh, thanks so much. I'll hang around if people want to chat and drink more coffee. Free coffee. Free coffee. It, it, as someone who um, has been in education for a long time and now you know in, in my role we were I was at a leadership retreat for a couple days and uh, up in Meredith and we were on a boat ride last night and um, turns out the bartender on the boat uh, graduated from here in 2008 so you always sit down and you say okay so what you study tell me your journey what you know and uh, economics and accounting major and he's uh, but he's found his passion, and he's mapped the whole Lake Winnipesaukee. He has the only map that really maps it out, a navigational map, talking about business. And I'm like, well, so he's like, so I've not really used my major at all. And I said, well, let's talk about that a little bit more. And he started to kind of talk more about what he learned in accounting. And I think that's the challenge. There's so many pressures we put on students to kind of decide what they're going to be with their life as opposed to, as you're talking about, have them own what they know and have greater clarity when they move forward so they can look for those possibilities. So I love the Singapore example because it is unknown and it's going to change and the iterations they're going to have to have. And I think from a workforce perspective, when I think about our, you know, the alumni who come to these sessions and want to know how are we preparing our students for the workforce, it's like what am I going to be able to articulate about how I can contribute if I don't have clarity of what I've learned, right? Um, so, so thank you so much this morning. I really appreciate it. So I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't um, ask you to think about um, what your next opportunity is with us to engage. Um, certainly we have these kinds of programs. We have 
uh, students who seek internships and placements. If you're in the world of education, you haven't thought about using uh, our uh, students to be a part of shaping your community, we'd ask you to do that. If you're in the business community, you've thought about um, how you might take our talent and help shape them and have them be even more ready for when they graduate, we'd hope you think about that too. Um, but most we're grateful for you to joining us this morning. We'd ask you to connect with each other, and we hope that we'll see you at an event in the future. Thanks for being here.